Greetings, guest. Welcome to the patriarchy, where we explore cinema classics fueled by predictive Hollywood programming and unpack how our favorite characters in cinema got egg all over their faces. I am your commentator, Dom, and tonight we're unpacking Ira Levin's Death Trap. It worked. She's dead. Yes, of course. She's had minor heart attacks over my slice. As we embark on the month of October, it's only fitting to analyze a few thrillers. And if you've been with me for a while, A, I want to thank you for your continued support of this channel, and B, you probably remember this channel kicking off about a year ago from now with a series of Ira Levin stories. We are going to revisit some of those today, but not before talking about Death Trap. So I recently watched Death Trap as suggested in the comments of a more recent video and wow, oh my gosh, what a plot. I did not expect all of the twists and turns and if you haven't seen it, it is free to watch on both Tubi and YouTube. So Death Trap came out in 1982 and was adapted from the stage play of the same name written by Ira Levin. And this plot is yet another film displaying the vividly wicked imagination and the extraordinary creative lengths that some men will go to rid themselves of their wives. This almost tops Hitchcock's Vertigo, another story about an elaborate ruse a man concocted to unalive his wife. So Sidney Brule, played by Michael Caine, is a famous playwright in need of another hit. So he develops this plan to steal an aspiring young playwright, Clifford, played by Christopher Reeves, manuscript that he's been working on titled Death Trap. Sidney's character is a bit of a brute. He's the creative type, very moody, and overall dismissive of his very supportive wife, Myra, played by Diane Cannon. And in contrast, his wife, Myra's character, is the opposite of Sidney. She's a bit bubbly, supportive, tries to inspire him, and overall has a very positive attitude and outlook on life, while Sydney, on the other hand, is much more grim and sulky. And I'm going to do a video of why we see this pairing of personalities so often in film, the moody, sulky husband with a peppy, supportive wife. But back to the story, though, he, Sydney, concocts this elaborate plan to get the aspiring playwright Clifford unnoticed back to his home under the guise of mentorship to seemingly unalive him and steal the play that he's been writing for himself. So Sidney gets Clifford back to his house, seemingly carries out the plan to take his life and steal the play. And after all is done, now Myra, his wife of 11 years and the woman that he's just made an accessory to murder, says, and I quote, you must have always been very different from the man that I thought you were. You are completely alien to me, Sydney. And that just can't be since five o'clock. I mean, you must always have been very different from the man I thought you were. And flat out states that she wants him to leave. In a month or so, if we haven't been arrested. Sydney. What? I want you to leave. Now, this is a very important point in the plot, given what unfolds next. And I'll just get right to it. Clifford wasn't actually offed or unalived by Sydney. He's still alive and comes back into the house to scare Sydney's wife, Myra, to death. And this was Sydney's plan all along to kill his wife without a trace. And Sydney knew that the shock of seeing a quote unquote deceased Clifford again would scare her to death because she was known to have a weak heart. And this was all done just so that these two men could be together romantically. Afterwards, Clifford moves in, they start working on a play together. And that's not the end of the story, but that's where we're ending it to discuss the topic of why not just let that woman leave, like she planned to do after witnessing Sydney's contemptuous behavior? Or better yet, why go through the elaborate ruse in the first place? Just leave if you want to be with another man. And I know, I know, it's just the play, and it made for a very interesting and suspenseful story, yes, but this does happen in real life. It happens in real life. 
maybe not as cleverly and creative as what unfolded in Death Trap, but the mind of a man can turn extremely wicked when trying to, in the most cowardly way, leave his wife. And there is a term for this, IPF, intimate partner femicide. Let's pause to see what the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, has to say about intimate partner femicide. A recent report from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention based on homicides in 18 states highlighted that 55% of the homicides committed against women in the U.S. involved an intimate partner. That's more than half. Moreover, roughly 60% of all female homicide victims are killed by their intimate, opposite-sex partners, while the corresponding figure for men is below 10%. Take that snapped, in Sweden and Europe, respectively. Overall, factors related to perpetrators are particularly important when assessing risk for IPF. Unemployment has been identified as one of the few risk factors related to socio-demographic background. On a similar note, the perpetrator having economic or work-related problems in the past six months has been identified as one of the most important risk factors in a recent study. And it's my personal opinion that men, and I can only talk about American men and men in the United States, but so much of a man's identity in this country is tied to their profession, their career, the money that they bring in. And these are all constructs of patriarchy. So it would make a lot of sense that if a man is having money troubles or experiencing career setbacks, like being fired, laid off, demoted, that they would take their severely misplaced anger out on their partner. And to support this opinion, not too long ago, there was a very popular trend on TikTok or Twitter of women sharing their stories about how mean men can get when they're broke. But back to the report. Mental disorders and substance abuse disorders have been identified to be risk factors for future IPV, intimate partner violence, and IPF perpetration. However, the literature is somewhat unclear in what types of mental disorders actually pose an increased risk of severe or lethal violence against an intimate partner. Findings from a meta-analysis on risk factors for male IPF perpetration suggest that substance abuse by perpetrators significantly increase the risk of IPF. While history of mental health issues was found to be a significant but weaker factor, i.e. if your man is an alcoholic or drug addict, you need to leave, let him get the help that he needs, and unless you are a licensed professional clinician trained to assist with his addiction, you cannot help him. Your love won't save him, but it might harm you. Overall, studies on clinical features involving IPF perpetrators are relatively few and inconsistent, and I wonder why that is. But back to Death Trap and all of the other real IPF perpetrators like Scott Pearson and Chris Watts, the question that I have is, what's with all of the mind tricks and manipulation and schemes? It seems like so much more energy than simply having a direct conversation. And yeah, feelings might get hurt, but it's less energy and criminality to have the direct conversation. And I have a playlist of Ira Levin's stories that I'll link here, and I am a fan of his works, I truly am. He really exposes the sinister minds of the male species through storytelling. Rosemary's Baby, I watch every Halloween more than once, but the bare bones plot is about the suffering of a young woman whose husband drugged her and gave her body to Satan, all in exchange for career success. A Kiss Before Dying, the plot about a gold-digging guy who pushes his girlfriend off of a roof after he gets her pregnant. Stepford Wives, a man moves his wife and kids to Stepford and turns her into a robot. Death Trap, a guy scares his wife to death to be with his lover. And by the way, all of the female characters in all of the stories that I've just listed are portrayed to be completely unproblematic. They're all super sweet, supportive, and submissive, but fall victim to these characteristically vastly different men. 
And I like to put a snippet of this interview that features Ivor Levin about how particularly in Rosemary's Baby, but I think this could be said for Stepford as well, that after these tragedies against these women occur, they are expected to acquiesce to their new normal. I think that one of the things that's so unsettling about Rosemary's Baby is the fact that uh, a kind of uh, normality surfaces again at the end uh, that makes the reader very uneasy because this is motherhood and yet uh, the child is the devil <laughs> or the son of the devil. Well, I, I do like to keep a little element unreconstructed at the end, a little of the horror still loose because I think that makes it work sort of stay in the mind more. <laughs> Rosemary's Baby was really landmark in that way, I think, yeah. in terms of... Uh, Thank you. Uh, really turned a corner in terms of, of as you said, a new, a new normality at the end, rather than what was normal in the first 20 pages. Mm -hmm. Usually, unless the author is unduly perverse, the heroine survives, or the hero, and mm -hmm. is a better person for the experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, the heroine is made a much better person because of her suffering. This concept works in movies, but in real life, suffering is overrated. So what are your thoughts about Ira Levin's Death Trap or any of his other stories? If you have a personal favorite, please drop the title down below. And as always, thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe for more. Signing off now, your friend, Dom.